Yep. Um, this is the bread and butter of the industry for us. This one has a little bit more bells and whistles than a standard would have with the second axle. And this one here does have a true 100 CFM air compressor. Um, starting up here at the front, we have an Isuzu engine. It does come with the standard two year warranty. This is right from Isuzu. You can get it repaired if needed, but these things are relatively bulletproof. They're like marine grade. You could basically submerge them as long as you have your exhaust out of the water. Thing would, don't recommend doing that with yeah. the equipment, but it could withstand it. Again, wanted to point out that I beam channeling framing that's structurally sound. Uh, you have your true 100 CFM air compressor. The reason I word that uh, put that word true in there is because my competitors might put a 100 CFM air compressor on there, but they can't get a 100 CFM out of it because their engine isn't big enough. Okay. One of the things we were forced to do a few years back due to um, emissions re uh, regulations, we had to jump to a little bit bigger engine. We used to only put a 70 on there because that's all we could power, even though our specs would always say to clean with a 100 CFM air compressor. We just didn't have the engine power. Well, as Isuzu and the emissions changed and we got a tier four compliant engine, forces go a little bit bigger, but it allowed us to run this at true 100 CFM. So if we were to power this up right now and you were to take that uh, cold air lance, you'd really see how much debris that can just blow out of a crack. Um, can it, is it, is it, can you, can you put a hot air? Yes, you can. Yep. Okay. So all you need to do, a lot of people's trap on the side here, or on the side there, you put a propane tank, runs the new set of lines, you can put the hot air lance that we sell as well on there. Is an option? That. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, but this one just happens to have the cold air. Um, you got your diesel and your hydraulic fluid tanks here. Um, then you have your heated hose and wand. Um, so one of the things about the Craftco heated hose and wand that I'm most proud of is we've gone through several iterations. We've realized where the weak points were on these. We started with the same company that's making sim lines and that's making some of our other competitors hose and wands out there, and that's through Copper State. Yep. yep. Problem is those are really unreliable. They are really fragile, um, especially at these union points, uh, where ours um, are fixed in this position here. You've got the ergonomic handle, also these um, junctions. These are the same, when I was in the military, for communications, we'd use these same Amphenol connectors. Oh, really? They're really robust. They still have, you still gotta use common sense when you're working. It's still probably the most abused piece on this equipment, yeah. but we've gone through several iterations and now we have this as field repairable. It used to be you had to send these into Craftco to have them repaired, yeah. a couple hundred bucks and then send it back to you, but you'd have to wait that month for them to fix it. Now all of the components inside this wand, we stock right here in our facility. So if you needed this to be repaired, we could either send them right to you, there's a couple bolts you take out, swap out whatever you need, including this pigtail, which takes the most abuse, or you can bring it into us and we can do it for you in like 15, 20 minutes. Take this apart, re reassemble it, put the pieces back in it, and you're back out there and operating. Essentially the way that this works, you have to think of it a lot like a toaster, right? Yeah. When you put your toast in and press down, you see the red lines on the side there. It's electrical resistance, same thing. We're, we have an AC power generator that creates power, sends it back to the back of the machine, sends it all the way through this hose and wand, through this junction, and then it's grounded out here. And as those wires are creating resistance, it's allowing this to heat up, heats that hose up to operating temperatures about 380 degrees, 390 right in between there. It makes material flow so nicely. Um, this trigger assembly, um, it's, uh, as I mentioned- it's, So not, not to cut you yeah, off. No, by all means, jump So in your, so like on the competitors, Yep. Your hose is running right directly to your nozzle, right? Ours, the, yours just yours like that 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 handle and everything is heated yep. too. Yes, it is. Yep, yep. All of, all of this, all the components, all the way down, and it stops heating right at the tip here. That's where they all ground it out. Yeah, because we're running off of AC power, right? Alternating current. So at any point in time, one of those legs is operating as a ground, where the other one's operating as a power source. So it's constantly sending electricity through there. Okay, cool. Um, the trigger mechanism. Um, like I mentioned before, this is a true on-demand pumping system. So what that means is when you pull this trigger, the pump is running. When you let off the trigger, the pump shuts off. Unlike my competitors or like your old machine that had to recirculate, so you're either pumping out onto the ground or when you close it off, it's recirculating back into the tank, right? Wearing that the means, pump down. That means your pump is running at all times. Yep. So a lot faster wear and tear, whereas ours, it's inside the machine, it's heated and cooled with the machine, so there's no external heating components needed, there's no heat transfer that has to run through the pump to heat it up. It heats alongside the machine, and when you pull this trigger, it activates the motor on top, turning the pump on, you let off the trigger, it shuts it down. So a lot less wear and tear on your pump. Um, also, the, the design of our tank, along with the agitation, much like how they do testing for ASTM specs, they have a circumference or a diameter of a, um, of a 
uh, testing beaker, right? And then they uh, use a certain speed for their agitation and then they test it just like that. All we've done is basically take the ratios and replicated that and scaled it up. So we have as close sweep agitation as possible. Our paddles get very close to keep all that material mixed inside there, reducing the amount of buildup on the side, but also reducing any of that cool areas or, or areas that don't get hot enough. <coughs> How so tall is your mixer? Um, it go all the way up the sides? No, no. Um, it it uh, probably is about three quarters of the way up. Oh, wow. But enough that it'll, yeah, we'll, we can take a look inside. Because most of them, as you are know, really shallow, are, shallow. yeah, three know. inches, four like inches. A corkscrew around the center yeah. of the shaft or something. No, ours is true agitator paddles that are probably about That's two all, feet huh? in, in, in height. Um, there's also a strainer basket inside there as well. Yep. Um, that's designed to help reduce any uh, contaminants from getting towards the pump. The pump also sits on a plate and it's about three quarters of an inch proud from the bottom. Uh, so anything that did fall in there would likely sink to the bottom and never get into the pump. So right now, like my, my crack pro sucks your chips up, basically just grinds them down and yeah, sends them through the hose. Tear, yeah. No yeah, shit, huh? That's a lot of wear and tear on your, on your equipment. Like, yeah. This is going to prevent that. You'll still want to do regular cleanouts end of the season, but, yeah. um, but you know, those are the measures we put in there to prevent not only build up, but anything that does falls to the bottom and doesn't likely get into the pump. Um, something new to our uh, equipment here is this boom system. Um, this is zip tied here, so I don't want to take it off right now. But as you yeah. can see, this piston allows this boom to come down and be put up. So that allows you, when you're working out this far, it's going to not only stretch a little bit further for you because it's going to flex mm -hmm. downward, but as you come back towards the machine, it's going to lift, take some weight off the hose, and actually yep. keep the hose keep from the dragging. Hose the exactly. So this thing like essentially that. operates mm -hmm. as that second man that a lot of guys usually are here trying to, you know, get assist with that want, the yeah, hose. So like this will actually it. keep that from dragging and keep it out of harm's way. Also make it so you're not tripping on it. And um, it, you know, was super reliable. I think they did like 300,000 flexes before like they showed any, any signs of wear on the piston. So these things will last probably much longer than needed, but regardless, they've been put through the ringer. Uh, really easy the way this thing just sets up. Went for transportation, this is just gonna get pushed down to here. It's gonna get loosened, it sits right on there. And oh, I like that, sweet. So, yeah. Super easy, all you're gonna do to undo it, obviously just do this, push this out and pop this out. Pull this pin, take this out, and then you're ready to go. Uh, coming on this side, we'll talk a little bit about the features on this side. Uh, we do have the, um, the, I'm really happy, especially having the mechanical background I had. They used to have this burner sat between the two tanks. Yep. It was so much harder to get at. And, you know, it just also wasn't um, super safe trying to work in that. So thankfully they kind of put it off to the side here. Gives us nice easy access to it. There's its own shut off for the fuel, its own fuel filter. Um, another great change that we made a few years back, we realized that having the same fuel filter for the engine and the burner made for it whenever um, the filter would get clogged, the, the fuel pump on the engine was much stronger. Yeah. It would still keep running, but it would starve the burner. So ah. we actually ran a separate fuel line oh, there you go. and its own filter. Uh, big change that we made in the last five years or so. Um, again, you'll hear me say it a bunch of times, Craftco looks to design things as safe as possible, but also easy to use. A really nice safety feature, I know my competitors have something similar, is this um, design to allow when you open this lid, this switch it decompresses and then shuts off and it turns on your agitation. So there's no risk of ever having the agitator running yeah, while it's, it's open and splashing out. Up. Exactly. And then the way you load this machine, you just open the lid, you put the block right on top. It's made to withstand that load and then you just close it right inside. So that way you're never in harm's way yeah, from the material. Um, this is where um, I always say for last, it's uh, kind of the brains literally of the machine. And um, although you might see a lot of lights, switches and dials, it's actually relatively super simple to operate. After you've set your temperatures for the first time, you basically never need to move them again. Mm -hmm. We're gonna set to 380, well, about 390, because our material goes down between 380 yeah. and 400. So 390 is a good middle there for our material temp. Our oil temp is gonna be at 500, and our wand is gonna be at that application of 380. After that, we never have to touch these dials. Unless we're operating with a material that has a different spec for temperature, we can leave it there at all times. I'm not gonna, oh, do we have the key for this one out? Um, and I really want to show you guys how this uh, how this turns <laughs> on and operates. So. so um, now that we've had this all set to the right um, temperatures here, oh, I don't even have the battery on this one. 
<laughs> I forgot they, they ship them without the battery. <laughs> you know what we'll do? We'll finish this at the machine right. that's out there because it's the same. Inside here is the same as that right. one. There's a few different things. You'll notice the boom on this one isn't like that anymore. I like the counterbalance. Like mine yeah. has a counterbalance yeah. boom. It makes so much difference. It really does. You know, it takes some weight off the user so they don't, yep. it's not as much as an RMAX size. Keeps the hose out of the way. I mean, mine doesn't keep it that far out of the way because I noticed your hose as well. You got a little bit with some ho yeah, rubber I mean, this on. Yeah, <laughs> this one doesn't have the anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this one doesn't have the, the counter boom on, on, on it either. All right, so startups is going to be super simple, right? So once we have our temperatures set, um, it's just auto and run. Now, if I were to just hit run here, it would still turn on and function. But the auto feature is really nice because it allows the system to only idle at the speed at which it needs to operate. Ah, the pieces that's so good. you're going to save a lot on fuel yeah so because in the beginning here when we're heating this machine up all we really need at that point is 12 volts to operate the bat the burner yep. so um the only thing we're on the engine for at that point is to maintain the battery to make sure we have enough power to the burner right yeah so a really low idle speed is all that's needed to keep that charge going so when we first start this up you're going to hear that it runs at a much slower idle and it's actually probably quieter than most of your equipment Still not super, not not crazy oh, quiet, but way quieter than us. Quiet, right? So we're not, we don't need this on the whole time to do the demo. So I'm just gonna, so I don't have to yell over it. But yeah, way quieter, right? Because all we're doing at that point is just idle running to to uh, run the 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 burner. Yep. After that, our burner will come on. It'll continue. We'll actually turn this on so we can see these. Uh, and I'll just. Uh, uh, the burner is going to come on, but that's all right. We'll just shut it off after. But as you can see here, only these two are lit up because we don't need to power the hose right now because it can't pump. Yep. Um, as these things come up in temperature, you can see right now we're just using the burner. Burner will come on, get it up to temp, and then as soon as it hits 275, automatically the hose will come on and start heating, mm -hmm. and the mixer will turn on on its own. Nice. The mixer cannot be turned on prior to the material being hot enough to use. Mm -hmm. Even if the mixer were to, were to get hung up, say you dropped a blog pin and it kind of got stuck, we work off bypass pressure. So um, it, it automatically, as soon as it hits about a thousand psi, the um, hydraulics are rerouted elsewhere. So you'll never deadhead this motor or cause any significant harm. If anything, it'll just make the hydraulic fluid a little bit hotter, and that's why we have a separate hydraulic cooler. I saw that. It'll cool that yeah, down yeah, all yeah, on its own. That was. Yep, yep. That's a, a little radiator for the hydraulic fluid. Uh, but you can't really hurt this system. Uh, all you'd have to do is come over to the um, uh, mixer switch, go reverse for a second, go back forward, and yeah, usually that would free it up. Worst case, you just wait a little bit longer to melt it. But you can absolutely yep. leave this in forward and start this machine up, and it'll come on and do everything and do it, it needs to all on its own. The other switches here, super simple. Compressor, obviously, for when you need the compressor. No reason to be intimidated by that. We have our lights. Whether it's work lights or just a strobe, that's what that light's going to be for. As I mentioned, that mixer switch can just stay in forward. That way we can just let it go. If we need to reverse, we can reverse it. It's a one-way reverse, return to neutral, mm -hmm. and then back to forward. And then lastly, our pump reverse. We'll go over that and shut down. But that's it. Wait for this all to get up to temp. And lastly, you'll see this pump light come on. And that's when you know you're able to operate and start putting material down. Super simple for even a new guy to kind of follow along and use. In yep. worst case, you got a nice guide right here that goes through everything because some people like to read better than audio so they can follow it here. Um, and then lastly, we'll just go through shutdown. It's just as simple as startup, every step but in reverse, adding one extra step, that's it. Our pump reverse does truly put our pump in reverse. It actually sucks material back out of the hose and wand mm -hmm. and cleans that out. Two reasons we want to do that. One, it makes the startup tomorrow a lot faster because yeah. if it's not full of material, it'll heat up a lot faster. Yep. Two, if this thing were to be full of material and someone has to move the hose for any reason, damage yep. you can, that's right. So if you're full inside there and you got braided wire all the way around the outside nice and tight, yeah, just you bend it, you're just cracking yeah, those yeah. wires. So we want to try and get all that material out of there, especially if this needs to be moved Keep and not really flexible and exactly yeah. you guys you guys get this faster than most people so <laughs> um so all we're gonna do is come over here pump reverse we're gonna hold that book says 30 seconds i think most guys think 30 seconds is a lot faster than it actually is so i tell them go two minutes what, what does it matter no extra time is gonna hurt it so right. hold that for about two minutes as soon as you're done with that you just let off and then it's the other steps in reverse we're gonna go burn it off when hit the off button, that'll automatically, the engine will idle itself down and then shut itself off. <laughs> and then lastly, you just need to remember to turn the key off so you don't kill the battery. But mm -hmm. super easy startup and shutdown. 
realistically, it's pretty foolproof. Guys really can't yeah. mess anything up with decent common sense. I know it's hard to come What's by. What's the but... burner lockout? So, um, that, oh, great. Uh, that's another feature we added. That's, uh, if you've ever had a burner that maybe the CAD, uh, some people call it a CAT eye. CAT eye. Exactly. CAD, yeah. C-A-D is the acronym. But, um, but those sometimes get dirty or uh, you'll run out of fuel or any reason the burner shuts off when it thinks it should be on. This will emit a, a high pitch frequency noise so you'll be able to hear from anywhere in the yard space. Oh. That way, because uh, a lot of guys will We'll have the burner go out and, and they'll be on the job prepping yeah and then they'll yeah. come back to the machine just has a red light yeah so the red light yeah. comes on someone has to notice it hit the right reset exactly button. but if you're out there working <laughs> and occupied you're gonna you know you're gonna spend yeah. an hour and a half cleaning then you come back go back all right let's go I'm like what the hell it's still at yeah. 65 degrees <laughs> yeah so now you'll actually be able to hear this and i promise you and then there's just a, re- just a, a burner in the neighborhood reset, will right? come over <laughs> and tell you that then you just hit the burner exactly just like your home oil heating oil systems or any you just Hold this down for five seconds, let go. It tries to turn the burner back on, and if it turns on successfully, you're good. If not, the thing starts alarming again to let you know it's out. Now, I know what you're going to say, that you're not supposed to drive with these running. Right. But there is a workaround on that. There is. So two reasons you're not supposed to drive with them while you're running. Some state regulations say it's illegal, so you can't drive with it running. Is mass? Does it? I don't think mass does, because I know mass you can drive with a hot box. That's good. (laughs) But the other reason is, and I'll tell you why, is you see that exhaust stack there? Yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah, right yeah. over the burner system, yeah. right? If you get a good amount of wind to get inside there and then get down in there, it can push some of the heat, potentially even the flame, back into the burner. Okay. And the burner itself, between the um, blower motor and the fuel pump, is a plastic coupling. I can show you that after, too. That plastic coupling just has a small flat spot on the spline where the spline meets to like a, almost like a keyway on that coupling. What happens is as you get heat that pushes down into there, just like anything else, it starts to expand. It allows for that flat spot to get rounded out. And then you'll just have a spinning shaft mm. not turning the coupling. And then one of the two isn't going to be getting, well, the blower motor powers everything. You won't be getting fuel. So right. your burner will shut off. Ah. So it just, and it doesn't, ha- I mean, are you familiar with George Dion? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He drove with his, for, I mean, what, what, what did he do this for 70 years? Yeah. He drove with his all seventy of those years running. We we that's what we we drive everywhere yeah. with so us running. I have to say that we can't recommend that because right. one state might, but also two, you could end up in the position where right. you get your job and now you have no fuel. We we've had the same we've heard the same thing where they say you shouldn't run it while it's running because you know, you could run the cat out. Sure. Burn the cat out or yep. whatever. Flame get, could get in there and do that too. And, uh, but there is a workaround though. So like if you're, do you guys generally heat up um, and then head to your job site or at least start it and then head to your job site? Yeah, we'll start it and then drive. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, one quick trick, especially if you're going from job to job. Yeah. Um, because if you do heat this up, say you do about a half hour heat time on the on the tank right before you leave in the morning. Yeah. Um, your heat transfer oil and your material is going to get pretty hot at that point. You're probably at least in the 200s, maybe maybe even 250s, 275 degrees, right? That's not going to cool down very fast. Right. But if your hose and wand was up to temp and you drove down the road, that's going to cool off right away. Right? Yeah. Like it's just not enough mass to hold the heat there. So what you can do is get your material up a decent amount of temp, and then you can turn one of these nozzles, either I mean these uh, indicators, the material or the oil down. That'll shut the burner off. So you're not driving with the burner going, but you can leave the engine running, and it'll continue to heat the hose and wand. Oh, okay. So that way you have this mass of 200 and something degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to get any hotter, so right. you still have to wait when you get there. But at least you can drive to the job site, <clears throat> have the hose still nice and hot, but the, yeah. turn your yeah. temperature back up, and then you'll but be able to go yeah. a lot faster. With the peace faster. of mind of knowing yeah, you're, you're right. probably not going to damage anything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you'll be able to at least cut down on your heat up time once you get to the job site. So. And what about, uh, what's the... Let's say you got a quarter of a hopper full. Mm-hmm. What's the startup to application time from so dead 50 degrees? 45 minutes okay. to an hour and a half. That's our uh, in general. And that's regardless. That obviously things play into that. How much material is in there, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. said. Um, the ambient temperature outside. But generally on, a, on an average 50 to 60 degree day with about a half a tank, you're looking at about an hour heat up. Okay. So application time. Yeah. Yep. But you could still start using it as soon as stuff starts to melt. That's right. As soon as you have your temperatures up yep. on there. Yeah. I mean, realistically, they, these are our two. Uh, this is kind of getting more into the mechanics of it. But these are two RTD sensors or resistance temperature detectors. Much like um, our resistance causes heating inside there, yep. these also measure resistance. And as temperature changes, electricity has different resistances. So 
I, is that the right way to say that? But you could actually use, there's a cross-reference chart in this um, manual that shows you if you were to take a multimeter, check your resistance on the probe, you could cross-reference on the chart and it'll tell you exactly what temperature it is inside there. It's oh. a good way to know, to check, to make sure your digital output is, yeah. is matching. But also if you were ever on a job site with a, uh, we have, um, Inspectors sometimes use the point and shoot thermometer yeah, yeah. and they're like, this isn't up to temp. Right. And it's like, no, 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 let me show you. This is significantly more accurate right. than your, your little lasers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can show you with electrical resistance exactly what the temperature yeah. is and they, they back off. At yeah. Um, so you don't have like mechanical gauge. Those take place of where your mechanical gauges sure. would go? Yeah, yeah. These are, yep, these are our two. Um, then they, uh, the output is then uh, put onto those digital displays. Um, and the way that these work, this one here dips directly into the heat transfer oil, telling mm -hmm. us the heat transfer oil temperature. We couldn't have this dip directly into the material because there'd be too much buildup of old material and everything else. So it actually sits in a cavity well that's right on the outside of the tank. The mm -hmm. reason I'm mentioning this is because when we're measuring temperatures, there's no way to measure the temperature of the very center of that. But we're only concerned about what we're really putting out at yeah. the bottom and on the sidewalls because that's what's melting first, right? Yep. And then coming down to the bottom, and that's what's actually going to apply it on there. And that's going to give us really close, accurate temperatures to what's coming out of the end of that is. Do you have separate like you know my sim line versus my crack pro had my sim line had a take in the front and the back of well, the front and the back mm -hmm. so regardless of what angle the machine was on it could pull material mm -hmm. where my crack pro only has a take from the back so if you're, going so if you're yeah. on any kind of incline you forward don't, you, don't get you can't get material unless yeah. you got over a quarter of a of thing. Yeah, no, ours is positioned directly in the center. Oh, okay. It's on the bottom? Right, right on the bottom. Okay. Well, but remember, I say yeah, yeah, it's yeah. about a... Like an oil know, tank Yeah, does. exactly. Yep, yep. yep. It's slightly proud, but it's right... Literally, the way that that works, that pump... Uh, do they have one out here? Sometimes they got one out from there working on it. But that pump sits on that plate a little bit higher, but then the, the uh, orifice for that plate, the pump is right there, and it pumps it down, down the bottom of the tank and then out the back. Where's the basket strainer on these things? It's in... The, so there's a strainer basket that sits... Yep. That, is attached to the uh, agitator paddles that rotates with it and it sits right over that pump. Oh, cool. Yep. yep. Can you, is that something that mid, mid job you can get in? You know, no, no, you, you wouldn't need to. You'll never oh, need to. That's oh, okay. something realistically, the only time that that ever gets service is when you're changing the pump out. Okay. And the one thing my competitors will say is, well, our pumps are on the outside, so they're easier to maintain. My counter to that is why do you want to have to maintain your pump? Right. We don't have to put packings in ours. Ours will last minimally about 2,500 hours, upwards of 5,000, depending on whose material you're using yeah. and how you take care of your machine. But yeah, and the other part of it is a gear pump will never just stop on you automatically. Did It'll you know, slowly start to show signs of wear, and then you can schedule it around your schedule on when yeah, you get yeah, service yeah. done. You know, that, I mean, that's why we have this hydraulic flow control. It's the only control outside of this, and that allows you to turn up how much material. I'll tell you, a brand new machine, with that all the way up, you there's nobody applying cracks oh yeah unless they're yeah. on roller blades and they're yeah, going yeah. on a road at you know 20 miles an hour nobody <laughs> it does come out speed. fast right so <laughs> so you can dial that back and then as your pump wears you start to dial that up a little bit and then you'll know okay i'm almost at the point where i'm topped out on the flow control i'm not getting as much flow as i want yep. i'll schedule this for maintenance and then it's downtime is about eight hours we swap it out put a new one in there and you're back again for another 25 to five thousand hours cool of work use so yeah, I mean, I will tell you, um, and, and I know I'm the salesman trying to sell you this, right, huh. like this machine, but I started with Crafco back when it was PMSI in this facility, yep. um, just sold from Dougie and Donnie over, the, and we still worked on Simline, we still worked on some crack pros at that time. I know things have changed for them too, and they've come up, but from a mechanical standpoint and somebody who's worked on these, the, Crafco is the only company that makes the equipment and the material, and they yeah, yeah. best make those work. There's a reason ours is a little bit more expensive than everybody else's, and I can tell you because it's the quality. Yeah, I like yeah. like I will say this like I like you this 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 wand setup. Yep. This is designed for guys who beat the ever living shit. That's right. Out of everything they touch. Yeah, that's most. You know of what I mean? Like yeah. the yeah. crack pros are more like um, simple in the sense, yeah. but. I, I say the Crack Pro is more made for a guy who's running his own operation. But the other thing too, um, uh, you know, we not only do we have all of the components here and the know-how to fix it, we can help you through that, but also 
for as reliable as they are, everything does break eventually, right? Yeah. But we have not only myself that knows this stuff inside and out, two mechanics here, and all the parts generally that go and can usually get you back up and running. Because time downtime on this oh, yeah. equipment can just cost you so much money. So yeah. Um, and then again, just uh, well, you have like, the flexibility too to be able to say, hey. Nick, my fucking machine shit the bed. Well, Ryan, I have three in front of you. Yeah. And uh, I'll do the best I can, but I can't make any promises. But I have a whole fleet of shit that you can rent. That's right. And yeah. I'll do the best I can that's with right. helping you on that. Exactly. You know, like that's exactly what it's there for. So that's good to know. Yep. I mean, look, as a business owner, shit's gonna break. You're gonna yeah, deal without gonna shit. Yeah. It's a, everything's an added cost, right? right? Like Elon Musk said something great I saw the other day, and it was it was like, when you own a business, you don't. You know, business isn't run around things that are going well and things that are doing good. Like, yeah. you're only, like, as a business owner, you're just focused on fixing problems. You're constantly, like, it's, you're off to the next thing. What's the next thing I can yep. fix? Like, yep. you know, I mean, and sometimes it's just easier to throw money at stuff. Hey, my machine broke. Ah, fuck. Well, I got to rent one. Like, yeah. whatever. So get it and get back out there and get That's the right. job done. That's right. Chances yeah. are you're making enough money. Yeah, I know. Yeah, if you're doing it right, you're definitely making uh, enough money. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool, man. That's uh. No, I appreciate you guys uh, showing some interest in getting yeah. through it all. Yeah. Yeah. And I just... All right. So, what's my takeaway from all this? Well, you know, I made some notes. Uh, my first note is I like the idea of the compressor, but a lot of companies who are making these nowadays have compressors built into them. So I would just say that if you are in the market to purchase one, that you make sure that the manufacturer has a motor on the machine that is big enough to push the CFMs that they're claiming that they have. That's a good thing that we should take away from this. Um, I like the option of a low idle. Now on my Crack Pro, you start it, it just runs like a Banshee. Now, admittingly, I've never bothered to check to see if there's an adjustment for me to throttle the machine down. It's just fucking always been rape tape, so I've just left it rape tape. So that's on me. I got to check that out. Um, I like CO Master's wand. I compare it to holding a gun. You know, if you have ever shot an assault rifle a lot of these newer assault rifles are plastic they feel cheap when you're carrying them versus um something made of metal something heavy you know it just feels heavy quality to me is heavy so i do like their wand setup idea um you know on my crack pro the wand comes all the way down to the disc and I'm not sure if I'm losing reach with that as I see theirs is a hose to like a three foot wand. So I don't know if that's a 20 foot hose plus a three foot wand or if it's all figured into the 20 feet, you know. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I like the, that heavy aluminum um Durab durable feeling like that's a plastic handle it's it's almost like a, a a wand for washing your car and i don't know if i don't know i don't know if i like that for for doing crack filling but um what else oh seems like that yeah so the control box there's a lot of technology in that control box you know it's all automated virtually which can be good and can be bad. I love technology. I, I, I you know, I, I the, the more shit something has, the more I'm on board. But I understand with the Crack Pro, they tried to keep it simple. They wanted um, to make it versatile and to be able to, um, if you have a problem or you need parts, you can go to any auto parts store and, and grab what you need and put it together. Now, that has a somewhat cheaper look as compared to this fancy control box that these guys are running. So a lot of the same options. Both of the boxes are pretty much doing the same thing. Um, but again, your Craftco one is much higher end. But 
you know, as Nick says, you know, these machines cost a lot more money. There's a lot more technology built into them. So you got to kind of weigh the practicality of that and find out whether or not it's good for you. Um, he says, not in this video, uh, well, he does say in this video, actually, I'm sorry, that startup time to run time can be anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. My Crack Pro, much quicker. And I don't really understand how that is. Um, they're both running and operating off of the same kind of burner system. They both really have the same method of, of heating up through an oil jacket. So I don't know why my Crack Pro can be putting rubber down in 20 minutes and this has taken 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So I'm just going to kind of call him out on that and say that it could probably work a lot quicker than he's saying. He's just probably being um, realistic or, you know, giving, uh, you know, best optimum conditions where you're melting all the rubber down and then being able to work where we all know if we fire these things up and get a little bit of rubber run, we can run material through them. So, um, and then something, it sounds so stupid, but it's something that, you know, my dad's always like, oh, you know, you got all this technology built into shit, you know, this, that's the shit that's going to break. And it's like, I noticed where the two um, thermostat or the two temperature gauges would be for your material and your transfer oil. It's, uh, it's all electric. Now he says, well, you can take uh, like a multimeter, throw it on there, get the voltage, run the voltage through a chart and pretty much be able to tell down to probably the 10th of degree what the temperature is inside of this versus you know, a, 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 um, a mechanical gauge where you're reading it in fives and tens and stuff like that. They're more precision versus, um, you know, a mechanical gauge. But there's a lot of times that I walk outside and I'm not even using my machine and I'm walking by it. And I want to know if what what's the temperature at? What's, you know, I just used it the night before. I'm going to be using it in a few hours. Where's my temperature at? That gives me a lot of uh, you know, a lot of the time it tells me when I'm going to have to start the machine or when we're going to have to start. And in this case, you, it looks like you would have to go to the control box and turn the machine on to get the digital gauges to register and let you know what things are versus just a couple, you being able to walk by it and seeing a couple mechanical gauges and, and knowing there. So I would just say, dude, it, you know, if you're building these things, fucking throw a couple gauges on there. Like, what's the big deal? Um... I mean, I think that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, there are some things I like about this machine, and there's some things that I don't, you know. And I had gone down there today to take a look at a piece of equipment that um, they are starting to manufacture for tennis court uh, resurfacing. It's a, um, it's a little, you know, this little drive-along trailer, 165-gallon trailer, that's uh, a mixer for acrylics. Um, that's going to be another video I have coming out. That's going to take a little bit more work to put together. I literally just walked in from from seeing him today and just threw the the GoPro footage up on the computer, throwing this little outro to go with it, and slamming it up there for you guys to for you guys to check out. So um, uh, the tennis court one's going to take a little bit more time to put together because. And I want to be as fair as possible, but, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest. And I think it's got a long way to go. I think it's in development. And I I think it has its, its purposes and its places. I just think it's not really, it's not really there yet. So, uh, but that's a different fish for a different barrel. So, you know, I hope you appreciated Nick's time pointing out the uh, Super Shot 125. And uh, you can pretty much expect um, nothing but quality as far as the Craftco product goes. So, you know, you it's up to you to make your own decision. And I will be talking with somebody from Sealmaster next week, CB, the general manager from Sealmaster. And he's going to go through the Crack Pros for us. And, um, yeah, we just want to be able to give you guys options 
you want to be able to compare this stuff and understand the differences between the equipment and as the channel moves forward that's going to be the stuff especially over this winter that we try to focus on and it's going to be the the details in the the geeky side of things so stay tuned